So around September last year, there were talks of Formula One bringing the circus to the shores of Colombia. But despite what you might believe, they wouldn't have called it the Colombian Grand Prix. It would be named the Caribbean Grand Prix, which on the face of things to an uncultured swine doesn't make the most sense in the world. After all, ain't Colombia in South America and not the Caribbean? Well, the race would be held in Barranquilla on the Caribbean coast near the Caribbean Sea. It also hosted the Central American and Caribbean Games in 2018 and has been described as one of the most modern cities in the Caribbean. So. Yeah, it would be in the Caribbean and it would be an ideal candidate, I think it's fair to say. But still, if we were to think of other candidates for a Caribbean Grand Prix, I guess there is Nassau in the Bahamas. That region does have some history with racing, dating back to the 50s and 60s, where they attracted top American talent, or even Dover Raceway in Jamaica. Granted, it probably isn't quite up to grade 1 specs, but it does have a fantastic atmosphere and a genuinely fun little track, provided you don't die. This bushy park in Barbados is a slightly dead racetrack in Haiti. We can bring back the Cuban Grand Prix, only this time with less kidnapping. Or actually, on the subject of bringing back older Grand Prix, maybe they can finally make good on the Carousel Grand Prix, a Grand Prix that was held 38 years ago and at one point looks set to join the Formula 1 calendar and become the first Caribbean Formula 1 race ever held. But obviously, that didn't happen. But the race did happen, in very weird circumstances. Even to motor racing geeks like myself, this race was really f***ing strange. And I couldn't just not do a video on this thing, so may as well dive straight into it. Back in the 1980s, motorsport on the island of Carousel was, well not exactly booming, so to speak. But they did host drag racing competitions and other racing events, mainly spearheaded by Paul Vetterford, who was massively influential in the local motor racing scene. But as is the case with anyone with big dreams and a lust for four wheels and an engine, he looked at Bernie Eccleston's attempts to over commercialise Formula 1 in the mid 1980s and thought, you know, he, he likes street circuits, and we have streets. Maybe we can offer one of our own? Now, this idea, while it's pretty nice, does come with some slightly massive problems. Organising a racing event, no less a street race, is not far off organising a music festival. There is more to it than slapping a bunch of concrete barriers together. And ultimately, you don't want to end up with Motor Racing's version of Firefest, whilst also charging five guys prices for anything remotely tangible. It would take around five years for this project to get off the ground. And these guys sure did their homework. First order of business was scouting locations and roads that could be used to host the race. What was known was that it would be held on the streets of Valimstad, the capital of Carousel. Once they knew what was suitable for racing, they went to the local powers that be for permission to race on said roads. Once they knew what could and could not be raced on, they designed the track, whilst also securing a date for the proposed Grand Prix. Oh yeah, they also needed funding. You know, just in case we forgot for a moment that motorsport wasn't, you know, free. But they weren't kidding around with this thing. They were genuinely trying to make this a proper Grand Prix. Speaking with Formula Scout, track manager Jean-Robert Van Hutten said, We had over 450 people working on the track. Also, the grandstands were built on the main roads. We had a big circus tent for all the race cars beyond the pits. But we, we were a staff of 25 working for five years to get ready for that race. We went to Detroit and Dallas's F1 races to work and learn everything and study the rules of the FIA. Like, when we ordered the guardrails, we knew exactly how many bolts and nuts we had to order and how many rails. We even had marine rescue divers on standby. You do have to applaud the foresight of a dude who knew they'd need rescue divers for a race where Italian drivers were too close to the sea. So with all that talk, we can at least be certain that this would be run better than a local flea circus or pretty much any American Formula 1 race in that time. Ironically, the local governing body, the FAC, weren't going to be able to pull something like this off. After all, they never had anything like this before. Someone that did and would be better suited to the task was the SCC the Sports Car Club of America. And then there was the matter of what exactly would be racing in this event. For sure, they had their eye on Formula 1. They wanted to entice Bernie Eccleston to bring that party over to their shores. But they was little fish in a huge friggin' ocean. Best bet was to run a sort of warm-up before attempting to vie for the top flight of motorsport. So, they somehow convinced the series organisers of the step below Formula 1 to come along for a non-championship round. The series in question being Formula 3000. In a basic sense, the equivalent of what we know nowadays as Formula 2, with around five years of preparation for this event. With every I dotted and every T crossed, when the F3000 Brigade rocked up in the early hours of the morning, fresh from the airport, they looked upon the track and thought, oh boy, 
Indeed, the track wormed around the capital of Valimstad, just like intended. But in some areas, the streets allocated for the Grand Prix were so devastatingly narrow that it was starting to rival the likes of Macau and Monaco. It measured 2.2 miles in length, which compared to the rest of the tracks on that year's Formula 1 championship meant that it was shorter than all but one of the circuits. The main street was interesting too, in that the first few qualifiers would be rewarded with having to start on a corner, right next to the pit exit. It wiggled around the harbour for the first sector before passing a couple of cemeteries for the second one, which might have been a bit unnerving. Then the final sector utilised roads only ever dreamed up by track designers from Gran Turismo. Not that that's much of a bad thing, but what we got was a track that was overall quite cool, sprinkled with the occasional what the f*** in between. We have had some street circuits like that before in Formula 1. But it didn't take very long for them to die. I've been largely positive so far about this track, about the preparation, and about the idea that Formula 1 should, you know, with it being a world championship, actually visit all corners of the world. So what made this Grand Prix strange? Well, <laughs> Where to begin? With the track being so narrow in a lot of places, there were concerns regarding how they would rescue a car once one of the 912 Italians on that grid had their usual accident. There wasn't much in the way of escape roads or access points for marshals, so the SCCA came up with the uncanny solution of black flagging the whole session, forcing everyone into the pits so that they could fetch the errand car lickety split and have the session back up and running right after they'd had lunch. And despite the track looking to be an overall decent nick, there were reports that the track wasn't up to scratch for what was required of Formula 1 tracks at the time. But hey, it was an F1 so who cares? That wasn't the only problem however. Being a Caribbean island near the Caribbean Sea, with Caribbean beaches that had Caribbean sand, it made the surrounding roads a tad slippery, as a lot of sad sand would blow onto the circuit, and combined with the local climate, made the track a little closer to a rally cross course than the cars, tyres and drivers would ever care to want. Not to mention too that there was no thought given to the condition of the road itself. Not that it was full of potholes or anything, but a lot of old cars would drive around on these streets every day and these things would tend to spill some oil and I think now you can see where this is going. So a green track that's been doused in sand and oil with concrete walls all around you and a track layout that no one's ever driven before because it was the inaugural event and the track was only finished on the Thursday morning before the race. The upshot is that teams and drivers had to adapt. Those with heavier cars had an advantage at getting the power down but they also had to tinker with gear ratios so that they could negotiate the circuit without looking like a cow on ice. When all was said and done, it was Mike Thackwell from New Zealand who took the pole, which he probably would have done anyway, whether the track was optimal or a straight up river of lava. But of course, this being Formula Racing in the 1980s, it was so not equal. Different cars, different tyres, different different everything. The cream did rise to the top, yeah! But time differences back then were measured using calendars, and with the slippery circuit, it was even more unequaler. The track was so slippery that for practice and qualifying, teams were having to use wet weather tyres, even though not a drop of rain fell that weekend. And when it came time for the race, they had run out of those wet weather tyres. So, they would use qualifying tyres for the whole race distance, just so they'd have some amount of grip. Let that be an indicator of just how rancid the grip levels were that weekend. Grand Prix day came and Thackwell lined up first on the grid. A pretty standard sight on this time. What wasn't quite so standard was his car being pushed from the grid after the electrics went on strike, which was a suboptimal method of trying to win the race. Alas, the issues were terminal, meaning that the only non-Italian thing on that grid turned out to be the first thing to destroy itself. Already this race was defying every law of nature ever written. Once the race got underway, Ivan Capelli shot into the lead, carrying the pride of Italia on his shoulders. This, along with the looming pressure of Thackwell's teammate John Nielsen proved too much. The Dane would take the lead from Capelli and he would keep it for the rest of the 58 laps to take home a splendid victory. You may not have heard of these guys, but that Rolt racing team of Thackwell and Nielsen was a devastatingly underrated combo and both deserved a proper shot at Formula 1, but hey, a Curacao and a Cal Grand Prix win between them? That's a resume worthy of a god. The rest of that race wasn't a throwaway however. Up and down the field people were just trying to reach the end of the race. Anyone on Bridgestones was trying to keep their race alive, and anyone on Avon tyres was trying to literally stay alive. Trying to get the tyres to behave was about as futile a task as trying to achieve peace on F1 Twitter. And keep in mind by the way, this field was littered with Formula 1 drivers such as Capelli, Christian Danner, Emanuele Perro, Claudio Langes, Lamberto Leone, and former
former ABBA drummer, Slim Borgard. There was also Johnny Dumfries, who would serve as Ayrton Senna's teammate in just a couple months' time. And there was also Gabriele Tarquini, although his race did not go so good. When the race was done, however, the party really began. Put it to you this way, when Eddie Jordan shaves his head before jumping into a pool with international dignitaries, with a chart-topping Cuban-American band bursting everyone's eardrums in the background, you know it's worth turning up to. Overall, despite the issues with track width, track conditions, martial vantage points, and a skinhead Eddie Jordan, the event was actually a rousing success. Drivers liked the track whenever it wasn't trying to kill them, the spectators enjoyed the show, and critics marveled at the event overall, and about how this could potentially blossom into something more than just a non-championship round for a European series. Potentially, they can actually bring Formula 1 to these shores. It was certainly helped with news that Bernie liked this event, and even flew there to meet with the promoter to discuss potential plans. So, the wheels were in motion. But ultimately, geopolitical issues, given Curacao was still a part of Holland back then, curtailed all these efforts, and essentially meant that the 1985 race would be the only time this race would happen. What's more, the upgrades required to bring this track up to Formula 1 standards was too much. And by this stage, Bernie was already getting fed up with tight twisty street circuits built overnight that were bathed in oil spune from a 26 year old Buick, and thus buried the dream of a Curacao Formula 1 race altogether. Neighbouring country Aruba tried something similar in later years, but that fell through before it even left the ground, and now both countries are left with naught but a drag racing strip each. Pity. It could have been something. And we would have been blessed with a Caribbean Grand Prix. Could it be done today? Well, again. Upgrades. The track was barely suitable for Formula 1 racing back then, and it's no better now if we're going to be totally honest. To bring this track up to Grade 1 specs requires an ungodly amount of money, even for street circuits. Just have a look at what the likes of Jeddah and Miami do nowadays. Times are different. The demands are now higher. To be honest, a better solution for a Caribbean Formula 1 race might be to go to Willemstad Airport, dish out a couple hundred bucks, and take a plane trip to Barranquilla.